Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Kevin Talek Marston, and it is my pleasure on behalf of the Society for American Soccer History, also known as SASH, to open this, our sixth First Friday session. Founded in 1993, SASH works to promote, facilitate, and disseminate research into the rich history and heritage of soccer in the United States. You can best find us in two places on the web at ussoccerhistory.org and on social media on both the Facebook and Twitter accounts. And you can certainly follow First Friday Sessions um, at hashtag FFSS. Our next session, uh, next First Friday Session will take place after in February, on the 5th of February after a nice holiday break. We have a number of ideas on tap for 2021, uh, but there's always space for the novel. So if you've been working on something and would like to present at a future SASH First Friday, then please do reach out to the SASH board. All ideas are welcome. And uh, from members or from future members, um, you can join the society through our website and we welcome new members with open arms and friendly feet. Thank you to all our members for your interest and support as SASH is its membership. A uh, quick reminder to please mute your microphone during the, the, the session um, at the bottom left. Uh, if you Doc, are not- I don't, I don't know if I'm the only one, but we can't hear you, I don't think. Could you guys oh. hear that last sentence? Are we, can you hear me? I can okay. hear you fine. I hear him. Yes. Hear you. Yes. So ju just as I'm saying, please, quick reminder to mute your microphone. Um, hopefully that uh, will make for a better uh, recording during the session. The recordings will go up online on the Society website next week. So I will just briefly introduce our panel. A big thank you to Patrick Salkel, who actually had the idea and took the initiative to set up this session today. And so I'll introduce the three speakers and then pass it over to him and he will chair the session. So Patrick Salkeld is an independent historian with the city of Raleigh and is a history graduate, both his BA and his MA from the University of Central Oklahoma. His research focuses on the cultural history of soccer in the United States since 1960, particular, particularly for Oklahoma, Kansas, Texas, and the South, and also on the history of parks, he has experience in the library and museum sector as well and has been driving some very important initiatives on digitizing soccer history sources. Our second speaker today is Jeff Organ, um, who's the founder of the Texas Soccer Journal, which if you have not had a chance to visit the website yet, you really should. He writes frequently about the history of soccer in Texas, and um, for the little tidbits, he witnessed his first ever soccer professional match on May 11th, 1974 at Spartan Stadium in San Jose when the Earthquakes uh, won their uh, inaugural and 3-3 victory against the Dallas Tornado. And he continues to support the Earthquakes to this day because he's a season ticket holder to the Houston Dynamo. So Jeff is one of the rare but proud uh, foreign supporters of SV Waldorf Mannheim, which is uh, where he was stationed um, in Germany during the army. So he's uh, also a foreign, foreign uh, supporter. And our third and uh, last but not least speaker is Dr. Rachel Allison, who is an associate professor of sociology and affiliate gender studies at Mississippi State University. She's the author of Kicking Center, Gender and the Selling of Women's Professional Soccer with Rutgers University Press 2018. And it was the subject of a rich 2019 Football Scholars Forum session, which I strongly encourage you to download and listen to if you haven't done so yet, as well as obviously picking up a book, uh, a copy of the book for yourself. And among the fun tidbits I found for uh, Rachel, she has taught probably one of the most wanted experience seminars on the campus, which is Quidditch for Muggles. So welcome to Rachel as well. Uh, Patrick, I'm going to turn the session over to you. Thank you so much for organizing this, and we are very excited to listen to the three speakers. Thank you, Kevin, for that introduction. So the panel today is called Soccer in the Southwest, South, Central, and Midwest United States. I uh, formulated this idea mostly to just get more research um, out there about a kind of little research area in the United States. Most of us focus on California or the East Coast, some Texas and Missouri. So I will be presenting my paper 
titled The Daddy and Guardian Angel of Soccer Football Here, Thomas Corden Powell in Soccer in Topeka, Kansas, 1910 to 1918. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So the title of this paper comes from an article in 1916 in the Topeka State Journal entitled Revive Soccer. Thomas Corden Powell's contemporaries knew him as an impersonator of Scottish singer Harry Lauder and the owner of Scotch Woolen Mills, but above all, as a soccer enthusiast, or as some newspapers put it, the round football promoter of Topeka. When I first read about Thomas Corden Powell in 2016, he was a footnote in my research about early soccer in Oklahoma, but he has evolved into a focal point of his own. From 1912 to 1916, he introduced and organized soccer teams in games for men in Topeka, Kansas. Despite his efforts, adult amateur soccer never achieved the same level of popularity as baseball, gridiron football, and to a degree cricket in Topeka before the First World War, partially due to factors outside of his control, such as the weather. Thomas Corn Powell further made his mark by introducing soccer into the Topeka public schools and the construction of the first regulation soccer field in the city, all of which reflected progressive era values of physical activity and the competitiveness of the Gilded Age, demonstrated by his desire to have a winning soccer team in Topeka. Between 1868 and 1902, little is known about Thomas Corden Powell. He was born May 26, 1868, and baptized on July 5th in Baptist Church, Shropshire, England. At some point, he moved to Southport, where he lived with his sister and brother-in-law until 1902. The three of them left Liverpool on the SS Rhineland of the Red Star Line for the United States on March 26, 1902, and sailed to Philadelphia on April 7, 1902. They then arrived in Manhattan, Kansas on April 24, and chose to reside in Manhattan for a year or two in the hopes of improving their health after a month-long trip from Liverpool to the Midwestern United States. Less than a year after arriving in the United States, Thomas Powell improved his health and started gaining notoriety in Topeka. On February 19, 1903, the Topeka State Journal published a review Powell wrote about Hobart's cod liver oil emulsion. He said that when he, <clears throat> before he started taking it, he weighed 125 pounds. And two weeks later, he had gained eight pounds after taking the emulsion every day. After a short stint working with a florist, he moved to Topeka and started working in the freight receipts office of the Santa Fe Railroad's auditing department on October 1st, 1903. No records exist for the next five years of Powell's life, but he must have enjoyed living in Topeka because he boasted about the city and encouraged other Brits to immigrate there while he visited Southport for five months in 1908. Powell then left Liverpool on the SS Saxonia on January 12, 1909. Upon his return to Topeka in February 1909, Powell filed, filed immigration papers to become a permanent citizen, which he later gained in 1916, and declared his occupation as a railroad clerk. A Topeka Daily Capital reporter overheard him saying in passing, quote, I am an Englishman by birth, but after crossing the Atlantic, I became an American. I don't believe in singing God Save the Queen every time the word England is mentioned, end quote. In 1910, he married Ella, Ella Isabel Stockham and became the store manager of Topeka's wool and Seuss and tailoring firm, Scotch Wool and Mills. Four years later, he bought the store. Powell made a name for himself as the owner and newspapers regularly praised both his and the store's success. 
operating the unionized Scottish woolen mills, granted Tom Powell connections to laborers, often of British, Scottish, and Irish descent, who, like him, enjoyed football and a location to hold team meetings. As early as 1911, working class men had been playing pickup soccer and practicing on the Topeka fairgrounds, but no formal teams had been organized. On October 16, 1912, after being asked to be team manager, Thomas Powell started the first attempt to organize the sport in Topeka when he called for a meeting for anyone who might want to play soccer against teams from Lawrence, Maple Hill, and Kansas City. Two days later, 20 men met in the Scotch Woolen Mill store and elected Powell as the captain for their team, the regulars. They held their first practice at Skeens Park on October 20th, and a week later, they won their first game against another local team, the Colts, 7-2 at League Park in Topeka. The following week, they met for a rematch. Now, soccer was not new to Kansas. Secretary of the Kansas City Inner City Soccer League, Edward Cartmill, wrote an essay about soccer football in Kansas City, Missouri, in the 1912-1913 Spalding's Guide and described the sporting events in both Western Missouri and Kansas. By 1912, collegiate teams had formed at Friends University, the University of Kansas, Kansas State Normal School, which is now Emporia State University, Haskell Institute, Washburn College, and Baker University. Tom Powell's Topeka team is mentioned in the 1913 to 1914 Spalding's Guide, but never included in the standings for the two states, unlike its future opponents, Fort Leavenworth, Kansas City, Missouri Football Club, Kansas City, Kansas Football Club, Schmelzer, British Americans, and Kansas City Tigers, all of which officially applied for membership in the Kansas City Inner City Soccer Football League in Kansas City, Missouri. Today, Thanksgiving and football are inseparable for many in the United States. But in 1912, Topekans were excited about a soccer game. Tom Powell had arranged a match with the Kansas City, Kansas FC, one of two prospective opponents to contact him in early November about a turkey game. The other was Baker University. On November 24th, he invited the public to an open practice at Western League Park, a minor league baseball field ahead of the game. The Topeka State Journal reported that Powell had received many phone calls from people wanting to know more about Topeka's first chance to quote, see a real English soccer football game between inner city teams, end quote. He and the Kansas City Football Coach Club coach decided to play the game on the Washburn College gridiron because of its seats along the sidelines of the field. Newspapers advertised that no other scheduled football games were to occur on Thanksgiving Day, 1912, which meant the soccer match between the Topekans and the Kansas City Football Club was the main attraction. Even the editor of the Topekan satirical daily, The Pink Rag, attended the game because he hoped to see somebody, quote, sock Tom Powell in the kisser, end quote. However, Below the game day news article, which also briefly explained the sports rules, the Topeka Daily Capital mentioned that a game between black gridiron football teams representing Topeka and Lawrence would be played at League Park in Topeka on Thanksgiving, but no kickoff time was noted. For many Topekans, including the Pink Rags editor, it would be their first soccer game. According to articles before and after the game, Tom Powell's team consists of players from South Africa, England, Scotland, the Isle of Man, and the United States, who had all played on prominent teams. Tom Powell refereed the game, which apparently did not bother the Kansas City squad, even after the game concluded when Kansas City lost 3-1. He saw this game as the start to a winning soccer culture in Topeka. According to a recap in the Topeka State Journal, a good-sized crowd attended the match and were pleased by what they saw, which led the reporter to announce, quote, the game is here to stay, end quote. 
After the game, Powell said, now that the people of Topeka know the nature of soccer, quote, I'll be glad to assist in the formation of any college or high school teams, end quote. He also reassured them that it would not interfere with gridiron football because soccer could be played in winter or in early spring before baseball and has the potential to bring large crowds. Ironically, the 1912 to 1913 season would be the last complete season for adult soccer in Topeka prior to the First World War. Afterwards, the weather made it difficult to schedule games and some seasons would only have some practices and some fixtures. But by the time the weather cooperated, baseball season often neared and Powell, who also loved baseball, refused to arrange any games with opening day so close. Despite few games in fall 1913, his team supposedly joined the Missouri Soccer Football Association spring 1914, after its secretary wrote to him. But they did indeed become members. Little came with the partnership and adult soccer faltered while grade school soccer boomed. After the Gilded Age, social reformers saw the period's excesses and strove to fix the consequential social ills. They attempted this by educating children, particularly those in urban areas of immigrant descent, and keeping them physically healthy through sport, while also controlling their activities through school sports leagues. By 1914, almost every grade school in Topeka organized the soccer football team, and enthusiasts claimed soccer was on the rise in the town because of the number of boys learning the sport. On July 13, 1915, the Topeka Public School System reorganized its sports league into the Topeka Grade School Athletic Association and pressured by Tom Powell, added soccer to its offerings for sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, which already included gridiron football and its variant forward pass. He said, quote, it is hard to teach the old fellows who have been used to the American style of football the game. The only way to develop good soccer material is to start in the schools. One writer for the Topeka State Journal noticed the gender disparity in Powell's unspoken assertion and commented on it, quote, isn't it funny how every kind of worthwhile sport has to begin with the boys, end quote. There is no mention of women or girls playing soccer in Topeka during this period, but girls competed in the Topeka Grade School Athletic Association's forward pass competition. Tom Powell donated and sponsored a trophy known as the Tom C. Powell Cup to be awarded to the champion of the eighth grade soccer tournament. Powell continued his Thanksgiving Day soccer game tradition in 1915 with a match between Santa Fe and the University of Kansas and made the decision to admit school children and adults into the stands for free to give the young players an opportunity to watch and to learn from older players. While he meant grade schools, Powell further doubled down on his philosophy by offering the KU team much desired experience outside of the gymnasium class, where none of the players had known how to play the sport prior to the beginning of the 1915 fall semester, just two months earlier. It was also a win-win scenario for Tom Powell's team, Santa Fe, because it could only play on Sundays or holidays due to the players' full-time jobs. Both sides went to play it for the pleasure of the game and to educate spectators. But Powell hoped to raise donations to pay for the college students railroad, railroad fare from Lawrence. It would be the first game between the Jayhawks and Topeka as heretofore the authorities, quote, would not let the students play on Sundays or Thanksgiving. But as a football game will be played this year on Turkey Day, there is no reason why a soccer game cannot be arranged, Powell told the Topeka State Journal. Five days before Thanksgiving, KU accepted his challenge after not responding to his letters for three weeks. Topekans had three sporting options that day. The Santa Fe versus University of Kansas soccer match at Santa Fe Park, a high school gridiron football game, or a motor car race at the fairgrounds. And the Topeka State Journal assured them the soccer game should be a stiff game because KU is said to have one of the best soccer teams in this part of the country. The game ended in a one-to-one -one draw, but for those children who attended, they watched some former members of famous British teams and college players, 
in one of the cleanest, best games ever conducted in Topeka. On November 30th, 1915, 500 children attended the slate of football, forward pass and soccer school games for the Topeka Grade School Athletic Association. In soccer, Pope defeated State in the sixth grade competition, but because of draws, the seventh and eighth grade championships between Lowman and Quincy and State and Lincoln respectively had to be played again. Quincy School then won the seventh grade Fullerton Cup and Lincoln, which lost none of its nine games, won the Tom C. Powell Cup. Both teams had only scored one point to decide the champions. The league director then created all-star teams for each sport and grade to honor those players who were the most loyal and played the best. Five days later, Powell presented the eponymous trophy to Lincoln School and the Topeka Daily Capital published the team photo with the principal and the trophy on the second page of the January 9th, 1916 issue. 50 teams across the grades competed in the soccer tournaments, playing a total of 250 games. For those who did not compete, thousands played on their own school grounds. In December 1915, Tom Powell partnered with the city commissioner to lay out Topeka's, quote, only regulation soccer football field, end quote, to be located in Klein's Grove, the new East Side City Park. Yet, even as some newspapers commented on the sports getting a larger hold on Kansas in 1915, active pursuits to organize adult amateur soccer games declined in Topeka by January 1916 as discussions also about a possible Western Soccer League began. On August 25th, 1916, the Pink Rag editor commented, something is wrong. Tom Powell has not been in on an item about soccer football in more than six months, end quote. A month later, Powell created another soccer field at Ripley Park. Despite this, no more games would be organized in Topeka. And on February 3rd, 1917, the Topeka State Journal mentioned that Tom Powell had been performing more bagpipe stunts than soccer. And the authors, the commentary's author asked, quote, is this an indication that Sir Thomas is not so viral as he once was or virile? Or was he driven to it by the lack of interest in soccer here? End quote. Two months later, the United States entered the First World War, and Topekans directed their attention towards the international crisis. One of Tom Powell's players and employees at Scotch Woolen Mills, John Jock Alexander McBride, was killed in combat in September 1918 while fighting in Europe with the Canadian Army. In his obituary, he was called one of the best soccer players of the Middle West. Though scheduling conflicts in the First World War brought Thomas Corn Powell's efforts to popularize adult soccer in Topeka to an unceremonious and hasty end, his story is representative of United States soccer history. As an immigrant, he introduced the sport to the city and used the shared interests to create a community of working class immigrant players and children through play. Powell also understood that to help the sport grow for generations, school children must be introduced to it as they will have more time to learn and to play the game, which will help to establish soccer in the US born population. Yet, he perpetuated Gilded Age and Progressive Era mindsets of prioritizing, quote, lowercase and Native American sports, end quote, which would be baseball and gridiron football by only scheduling soccer during their off season. Thank you. And so <clears throat> I would like to go ahead and introduce Jeff Oregon, who will be presenting his paper, Texas Soccer History in Three Stories. Jeff, if you want to go ahead and share your screen.
Let me try again. Okay, there we go. Sorry. Um, thank you very much for, um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Thank you very much for uh, allowing me the opportunity to make this presentation today. I'm a new member of SASH and it's an honor to uh, have this opportunity. Um, I do want to let you make you aware of the fact that a lot of this research that I've done here is very recent uh, information for me. And as a result, I'm pretty much going to follow a script as I go through this today. Um, not only because it's recent research for me, but uh, more importantly, to make sure that I don't ramble and turn this into something that's twice as long as, uh, as I would want to make it. Because it's impossible to cover soccer in the state in three, 15 minutes, um, I'm going to share three stories from early Texas soccer history in this presentation today. The first one is going to be a brief description of soccer in the state from more than 100 years ago. The initial reference to soccer I can find in the newspaper archives is from 1873 Galveston, a city on the Texas Gulf Coast. It doesn't surprise me that this port was found here first because foreign ships and immigrants came through the port frequently, at least up until a catastrophic hurricane basically destroyed the place in 1900. As others researching soccer in the 1800s have found, I find it, it was difficult in the newspaper archives to distinguish football played with association versus rugby rules. This was the case in Texas too, especially in Austin and North Texas. Detailed descriptions of games were rare, though I believe most of the early matches in South Texas were played with something resembling association rules. The first 1873 story in a Galveston newspaper described a football match being played at a Catholic church picnic. A team led by Mr. Coffey beat a team led by Mr. Matthews. One thing I found most interesting about the article was that there were apparently multiple players who knew what they were doing that far back. The story was also written as if it was general knowledge in the community what football was. It does make me wonder how long soccer in some form had been around in Galveston before then. This also doesn't come as a surprise because if soccer was in New Orleans in the 1800s, as it seems to have been, um, it's more than likely that it was in Galveston too, simply because those two ports competed extensively with each other for foreign shipping. From there, the sport advanced throughout the state in the 1800s, spreading into the Southern part of the state as immigrants moved inland from Galveston. A decade or so later, it was found to the west in El Paso and up north in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. The first unofficial state championship was held at an 1891 firefighters picnic. Teams from Galveston and Houston competed with a trophy awarded to the winner, though the newspaper never reported who this was. There isn't a plethora of secondary research material from the 1800s but there were a couple of amusing articles of interest that caught my attention. The first on the left from an 1887 Houston match demonstrates the kind of sarcasm that would have been right at home in sports talk radio or internet comment boards today. The most surprising piece of information on the right was one of the few references to girls soccer I have found until about the 1970s. A challenge was issued by a girls team from a seminary school to play a match in 1876 against a team of freshman boys. What is somewhat eye-opening about this is that this school is located 125 miles northeast of Galveston, three years after the first indication that I found of soccer in Texas, which again raises curiosity about how widespread the sport was in 1870s South Texas. The most detailed discussion of the early days of the sport in Texas, starting in 1879, were from San Antonio, 
which leads to the second story, how soccer lost the battle to football to San Antonio in the late 1890s. This is the picture of the first soccer club in San Antonio called San Antonio Football Club. Coincidentally, this also happens to be the name of the current USL championship team here, though football is spelled differently. In 1891, this club held a meeting at a local beer garden attended by 19 people where officers were elected. Shortly after, their first competitive game as a formal club was played with the second soccer team in the city called Mission Athletic Club, a match that was won by Mission. Soccer began to grow throughout the city over the next few years, including SAFC visits to various schools to introduce the sport. Out of these efforts, a high school team, though I'm not sure if it only included high school players, became the third team in the city. The first league, called the Alamo Football League, played its inaugural match on January 6, 1893, with these three teams in the league. But the inability to expand beyond these three teams over the next few years was an indication that the sport may not have captured the attention of the city. So it was no surprise that something came along that did. In late 1893, the Mission Athletic Club sent a team to Austin to play a match using rugby rules. The Austin team, which I believe was a team from the University of Texas, won easily. But it created enough interest that a return match was played in San Antonio a few months later. Austin won again handily, but 500 vocal spectators attended this game in San Antonio. 100 plus fans took a train down from Austin to support their team. These traveling supporters brought along horns and other noisemakers to add to what was a festive event. A few weeks later, 30 or 40 San Antonio fans traveled to Austin to see a sort of rugby football state championship between the Austin team and one from Dallas. Because the popularity the new sport engendered in San Antonio, most football played there that year it used rugby rules. In October of 1895, the rugby versus soccer battle finally came to a head. There were six teams ready to play in the new year, and the only decision needed at that time was whether to play using association or rugby rules. A meeting was held for a vote, again at the beer gardens, on which rules would be used to play that season. As this article indicates, it was pretty much a foregone conclusion that rugby rules would win out, win out, especially because it seemed the association game had seemed to collapse. And because as the rugby fans told you, it was the only real football game that was played. And dubiously also, they believe seemed to be safer than soccer. The next year, all football in San Antonio was played by rugby rules and little was heard from soccer in San Antonio after that for quite some time. For the next 40 years, soccer was a minor at best, part of the sports world in Texas. There were only local leagues and infrequent state championships. That era did produce my favorite Texas soccer team name, however, the Pirate Club of Galveston, who were one of the best clubs in the state for a couple of decades in the early 1900s. There was one rather strange exception to soccer's invisibility in Texas during these early years. And the final story is about how the second international soccer tournament in the United States came to be played in 1937 Dallas. To the best of my knowledge, the first international tournament in the US was the 1904 Olympics in St. Louis that were played by a Canadian club and two St. Louis clubs. Since there was no soccer played at the 1934 Los Angeles Olympics, the 1937 Dallas Exposition Championship, unofficial as it was, would have been the second tournament in the United States. I am curious to know if anybody here knows, anybody on this uh, Zoom here knows if this is true or not. Since there was virtually no soccer culture or activity for decades in the state, Dallas was a strange place for this to happen. A national writer, wrote in an article about this event that soccer is virtually an unknown sport in the Southwest. 
I think that's probably an understatement. The tournament was more like an invasion from aliens from outer space. But money certainly can make a lot of strange things happen. The previous year, the state of Texas had held its centennial of its founding at Fair Park, which is located just southeast of downtown Dallas. And over 6 million people visited this fair. Local business people decided to use the infrastructure that was in place and financially back another exposition the next summer. Thus the 1937 Greater Texas Pan American Exposition was born. The organizers decided to hold what was called a, what was a so-called Olympics in conjunction with the exposition, primarily to help promote the fair and increase attendance. In addition to soccer, these Olympics included other sports like track and field, boxing, and a marathon that became, began outside the city. Event organizers um, that were led by George Marshall, who was the owner of the, what was then called the Washington Redskins, scattered far and wide through Latin America to make personal pitches for all countries to send delegations, exhibit at the event, and organize a group of athletes to come to Dallas. To further encourage participation, a budget of $50,000 was set aside to pay for travel and living expenses for the athletes. The soccer event took place from July 15th to 18th at the Cotton Bowl on the site of the fairgrounds. On the left is an aerial view of the exhibition site from the previous year with the Cotton Bowl in the upper part of the photo. And on the right, an image of the stadium from a few years earlier. The first official invitations were extended in late March, less than 90 days before the Pan American Olympics were supposed to begin. At one point or another, Argentina, Uruguay, Peru, Brazil, Cuba, and Mexico accepted invitations to send soccer teams. And it would have been quite a tournament if all of them had accepted. But unfortunately, when the time came to tra travel to Dallas, Argentina was the only country to send a team. Peru, according to reports, was unable to arrange ocean transportation with such short notice. But it is unclear exactly what happened to the other countries, especially Mexico. Left with only two teams a week before the tournament, organizers frantically looked to Canada. They had not been formally part of this they had not been formally invited to this uh, to this, be part of this exposition because they weren't part of the Pan, Ameri Pan American Union at the time. A hasty invitation was extended, however, and Canada found a third team that agreed to participate on short notice. The United States Soccer Football Federation selected the national, national amateur champions from that year, the Trenton Highlanders, to represent our country. The Canadian Soccer Federation offered Manitoba first crack at providing a team, and they selected the province champions, the Irish Soccer Club from Winnipeg, to represent Canada. The Argentina team took 18 days to get to Dallas via ocean liner and train. They ended up staying in the city for close to a month. A colleague from Houston, Federico, who has a site called Toto Dynamo, is original from Argentina, and he's actually joined us on the Zoom session today. He helped research this team and found that it was a group of young players from clubs in Buenos Aires, mostly amateurs, called the Dallas Fourth Division. It was organized through what was essentially the first under 23 combine in Argentina. The games themselves, as you can imagine, were an exhibition of Argentinian dominance. They opened the tournament with a nine to one win over the United States. The next day, the Highlanders lost to Canada three to two. And in the final match of the tournament, the Canadians were defeated by Argentina eight to one. Since the Argentinians had time to kill while waiting for return transportation, they received permission to play an exhibition against a quickly assembled collection of local amateurs called the Texas Mexican All-Stars. Though the All-Stars coach talked big before the game saying, quote, if the Argentinians can't get the ball, they can't score, can they, unquote. Um, the result was as expected. Argentina scored in the first minute 
and won the game 13 to nothing, delighting the crowd with their technical wizardry when they essentially played keep away from the locals for the final 15 minutes of the match. The game, scored, the game report described it as crisscross passing and aerial balls. Argentina returned home later, or returned home a good week later with two trophies, the Pan American Trophy and a trophy presented by the Mexican Consul General after the exhibition game. Over the course of the three matches, Argentina center forward Angel LaFerrara was the score, was the star, scoring 13 goals. He ended up playing six times for the full national team in his career, scoring four goals. He was one of the only players from this roster who had this honor. The complete domination by this amateur Argentinian side does make me curious how rough it would have actually been for the US and Canadian teams if Argentina's full national team had been sent instead. An interesting note is that the US national team played their only three matches between 1936 and 47, a couple of months later in Mexico, where they were embarrassed. This tournament would have been excellent preparation for those matches, but for some reason, the US Federation sent the Highlanders instead. A couple of other notes. These Olympics are recognized as an unofficial beginning of the Pan American Games that continue every four years to this day, the next in Santiago, Chile in 2023. Brazil did announce while well in Dallas in 1937 that they intended to make these sporting games an annual event and offered to host it the next year in Rio de Janeiro. Because of World War II, the first Pan Am Games did not actually happen until 1951 in Buenos Aires. The other result of this tournament was the formation of a small junior soccer league in Dallas later that year. Don't believe it lasted that long though, because the Dallas tornado found a non-existent youth soccer landscape when they became play in the 1960s. After this tournament, soccer resumed its insignificant role in the Texas landscape for the next 30 years. Periodically, attempts to reboot, reboot the sport would arise with little effect. For all intents and, and, intents and purposes, soccer did not become a serious sport in Texas until 1967, when teams from Dallas and Houston joined one of the new professional leagues. I can't finish this presentation without paying homage to Lamar Hunt. Because of his efforts, especially the prime role he played in both NASL and MLS expansion into Texas, the sport will never need another reboot here again. There are now nine professional teams playing in all major markets in Texas. When the new Austin FC Stadium comes on board next spring, Texas will have opened six professional soccer specific stadiums since 2005, with three more on the drawing board. Finally, as all of you are aware, and many of you have visited, thanks again primarily to the Hunt family, the National Soccer Hall of Fame reopened in Frisco a few years earlier, or a few years ago. So um, this gives me an opportunity, I think, to do a lot of follow-up research that I intend to do um, over the next few years. And, uh, and I really have enjoyed the work that I've done so far up to this point. Um, I, I think like many others are very much looking forward to the opportunity to get out and travel and do a little primary research starting in Galveston sometime here, hopefully later next year. But again, up until this point, I thank you, Patrick, for inviting me to be part of this panel. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody. Thank you, Jeff. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Rachel Allison, who will be giving her paper, Patterns of Place, Origins of Professional Women Players and Reflections from the Midwest. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Can you see the PowerPoint okay? 
Yes. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to Sash for the invitation today. And thank you all for being here for um, this Zoom presentation on a Friday. Um, so as you can see, um, I'm a sociologist by training and most of my research has looked at women's soccer in the US, particularly at more elite levels of competition. And so that's what I'm addressing today. Um, I'm, I'll be talking about much more recent uh, soccer history than in our first two presentations. Um, so first of all, I used this presentation today to kind of dig a little bit into a question that has been in my mind now for well over a decade. Um, so I grew up in what's known as the Quad Cities, which are four cities along the Mississippi River, two just on the Iowa side and two just on the Illinois side that together have a combined population of 382,000 people. So this is a relatively large area of the Midwest um, for the, these parts of Iowa and Illinois. And when I started my own soccer participation um, in the Quad Cities at the age of seven in 1991, I joined the local community organization that was called Dad's Club Soccer. Now, as a child, I you know, took this for granted and I never gave much thought to this organization um, or its quite unique name. But especially when I was in graduate school and I began to think of soccer, not just as a personal interest, but also as a professional interest, um, I really began to wonder more uh, about how this organization had come to be and how it had gotten the name Dad's Club Soccer. So I decided for this presentation, I would finally try to answer that question. And so I did a little bit of digging and here's what I found. So Dad's Club Soccer was formed in 1949, so just after the Second World War. It was formed by five fathers of um, elementary school boys who attended an um, elementary school in the Quad Cities. It was initially formed not as a soccer organization, but actually as a boys softball organization, because these fathers wanted opportunities for their sons to play softball that at the time did not exist. So at some point um, after 1949, however, it transitioned from a, a softball organization to largely a soccer organization. And this is the part of the history that I couldn't quite um, pin down. So it would be quite interesting to figure out when exactly in history um, this shift took place and soccer began to be its kind of predominant um, organized sport and not softball. Um, more recently, Dad's Club Soccer has estimated that it has about 1,800 youth participants each year. And what distinguishes this organization, which is mostly volunteer-led and run, is that it is intentionally non-competitive. Um, so it's organized according to rules, for instance, that um, allow each participant to play every single position throughout the course of the season and requires equal playing time during games, for instance. It's also um, free to low cost, um, which makes it somewhat unique, I think, in the landscape uh, of youth soccer. Another really interesting thing I found out about this organization is that for about 15 years until 2016, it was led by a woman named Nancy Derschel. Um, and she's particularly interesting to me because in 2008, she became at the time the only woman in Iowa to be a head coach of a boys high school soccer team. Um, when she began to um, as the head coach at Davenport West High School, which um, it I have, just also happens to be the place where I myself attended high school at a somewhat earlier period of time. In a local news article um, that paid tribute to Dershal's accomplishments, she noted that often while coaching, um, she, her two male assistant coaches were often mistaken for the head coach, while she was often understood to be a team manager or a team parent, but not the coach. Um, she was quoted as saying, right, you just giggle, what can you do? In 2016, when Dershal retired both from coaching and from leadership of Dad's Club Soccer, this community organization was taken over formally by the city of Davenport um, and still exists today as a city-run city league um, that maintains its non-competitive and um, free, uh, free structure. Okay, so. I've answered some of my own questions based on my own previous experience in the Midwest. But what I really wanted to present today is some of my most recent research on the place origins of current women's professional soccer players. So in 2018, during a sports conference, former goalkeeper for the US women's national soccer team, Hope Solo, called the sport of soccer a rich white kid sport. 
Now for me, hearing these comments and seeing a lot of the public reactions to these comments made me think about the extent to which the current research literature supports these claims. I had some conversations about this with one of my colleagues here at Mississippi State, and this uh, led to um, our, our, our project, um, which culminated recently in a paper um, published in the journal Soccer and Society. So I'm going to describe the paper briefly here today, but I'm more than happy to send a copy to any of you who would like to read the full paper. So what we suggest in this paper, and I think what makes um, this presentation appropriate for, for a SASH panel, is that we're arguing, similar to others, that current patterns of representation in women's professional soccer reflect a lot of different historical developments in girls and women's soccer that certainly began post-Second World War, but especially beginning in the 1970s through the 1990s. Many of these, um, these are the developments that Rick Eckstein does a fantastic job in describing in his 2017 book that I highly recommend to all of you here today. Um, notably that the expansion of scholarship granting college soccer programs for women um, helped to spur commercialization and professionalization of youth soccer or creation of what he calls the pay to play pipeline um, for girls and uh, young women's soccer. As many academics, journalists and other commentators have, um, have discussed, this pay to pay pi pipeline also um, is cl clustered geographically so it's not unevenly, it's unevenly dispersed, clustered predominantly, for instance, in more suburban or affluent areas, and thus opportunities to play for both geographic, cultural, and economic reasons primarily available to white and affluent girls. However, we have a problem or, or a challenge from a research perspective, and that's if we want to understand patterns of representation, data on professional women players' racial identities and socioeconomic backgrounds is not publicly um, or comprehensively available. And gaining access, communicating with this pool of, of women um, to gain this information just isn't overly feasible. And so what we decided to do in the project is to look at the places that produce women in professional soccer, rather than right, a demographic analysis of individual players themselves. So here's what we did. We first made a list of all women who had ever appeared on a National Women's Soccer League team roster from 2013, which is when this Women's Professional League began play, um, to, at two, up to the end of the 2018 season. Again, we started this project after Hope Solo's comments in 2018, and so this was the most recently concluded Women's Professional season. We included all women who had ever appeared on a team roster for a game, who had graduated from high school in the United States, which did include a few women who um, had done a lot of their formative, you know, growing up in the United States, but may have been born in other countries. Using current or archived college and professional soccer team websites, we listed information that included each player's hometown, which is measured as the height, the place where they graduated from high school, their year of college graduation, and the number of years they had ever played professionally, either in the NWSL or in the two leagues that, um, that came before it. We measured this both as the number of years women had played professionally um, and also the ratio of seasons played professionally to seasons eligible, which is the number of years post-college graduation um, with that had operating professional leagues. Two of the players in this data set at the time had not attended or graduated from college before turning pro. Um, so, that this, so this at the time is a, a very rare pathway and still is today. So almost all other players um, had finished college before going into professional soccer. So we for each player's hometown or the place where they went to high school, we matched this to place-based um, information from the 2000 US Census using census FIPS codes. FIPS codes are 15 digit codes, um, place identifications within the census that refer to state, county, census tract, block, um, block group, and then block. So relatively small um, local designations. The, Particular variables we included from the US Census include measures of racial composition, varied measures of socioeconomic composition, like the percentage of residents in poverty, household and median family income, and also measures of geographic um, composition, including population, housing density, and whether 
the place was designated as a city center or suburb based in, based in census metropolitan statistical area designations. So I'm just going to briefly describe what it is we found. So overall, we found that um, national women's soccer player hometowns are more white, less black, less Latino, and more suburban than national average places with lower numbers of vacant homes, lower percentages in poverty, and lower percent unemployment, but higher median household and family incomes. So we see this as some um, empirical evidence that if, you know, is soccer, soccer a rich white kid sport? Yes, in that it is largely places that are more white, that are more suburban, and are more affluent than national averages that produce women in professional soccer in recent years. And of course, in the paper, we're also linking this to a lot of historical trends in the development of girls and women's soccer. So I think that there is some really um, compelling and interesting evidence, especially recently, that women that women's professional soccer, women's elite soccer more generally, has become more racially diverse over time. For instance, the NCAA shows that in Division I women's college soccer between 2012 and 2019, the percentage of women athletes who were white decreased from 76 to 67 percent, evidence of some growing racial diversity in women's college soccer. We could also, for instance, look at recent cohorts of NWSL um, early round draft picks to see that there are more women of color in elite soccer today. What I think we don't necessarily know is whether growing, slowly growing racial and ethnic diversity has also been accompanied by any measure of socioeconomic diversity. Um, I suspect that might in fact not be the case. For instance, the Aspen Institute, um, some of their recent research has shown um, declines um, that, that socioeconomic divides in sports participation among American youth um, have actually grown over time. And this is absolutely true in the sport of soccer as well as other sports. So I think there's a lot of really interesting implications of our, our current findings um, um, and a lot of interesting consequences. Um, in general, I think our research supports the concerns that Hope Solo expressed and that other women elite players like Alex Morgan have expressed recently, um, concerns about accessibility in the sport um, and, and the consequences of these patterns for a variety of outcomes that include the competitiveness of our women's teams moving forward into the future. All right, thank you everyone. Okay, thank you, Rachel, for that presentation. It was very interesting. So now I would like to open up <clears throat> uh, the floor for any questions that the audience might have. Um, not so much a question here as uh, on a, a plug of my own work, <laughs> um, but it's, I think, relevant a little bit here in the sense that I just finished um, if you follow me on Twitter, you may have seen this, uh, a directory of youth soccer clubs that play at a certain level meeting certain criteria, which we do want to get into here. And it wound up about 14, 1,450 uh, nationwide. Um, but what I found was that in terms of hotbeds of teams that clubs that play at an elite level, I, number one, far, far and away is Los Angeles. Number two is Dallas. Uh, there are just tons of huge clubs there. I mean, FC Dallas alone, um, which has interestingly tentacles down to Arkansas and other places, um, is uh, is quite successful. And we know players have been developed there, but it's also just a giant club. Solar SC is also giant. Uh, there's uh, Sting operations actually in three uh, Dallas, uh, three Texas cities, uh, and the unfortunately named Defeaters uh, of Dallas, which is now kind of working its way to Dallas Kicks. So um, that's available now if anyone wants to take a look at that, just as I will be asking Rachel as soon as this is over for all of her data. Well, uh, I would like to ask uh, Jeff a question. <clears throat> um, what year did you say the uh, San Antonio Football Club was uh, founded? Uh, 
it, it to, to, from what I've been able to figure out, it looks like it was 1891. Now, I'm not sure when that picture was actually done. It, it's coincidental how I found it. As I was going through and doing some research for a major project I did this year, uh, trying to bring the San Antonio Thunder from the North American Soccer League back to life, I stumbled upon a picture in the San Antonio newspaper, I believe in 1931. And what it was, was it was a, a contest the newspaper was running where readers could send in a picture and then have everybody who read the newspaper try to guess what it was. And this picture got sent in, as you would well imagine, nobody had a clue what it actually was. But it came from somebody that based on his name appeared to be a relative or could have even in that year, could have even somebody who actually played for that team. Very interesting way to find a uh, photograph. Um, Rachel, I also have a question for you. Um, in your <clears throat> uh, research, where did you find was the uh, most popular hometown for NWSL players to come from? That is exactly the question that I was just thinking of when uh, Bo was talking about his database, um, because we, we have that. Um, and I have not, it's been a while since I looked through the data and I actually don't remember off the top of my head, but I can find that and I will let you know um, because you can also kind of see um, some, some of like the, the hotbeds or the areas that are most likely um, to, to produce women in pro soccer. Does anyone else have a question? Patrick, I do. Yeah. Oh, go oh. ahead. Nope, go, you go ahead. Ellen. Okay, uh, Rachel, um, I have a question for you. Um, so I am a library science student. And so I'm really into metadata and labeling and how agency plays a part in uh, labeling. So I was thinking with the census and you may not have an answer for this, but um, how do you think um, people's autonomy and agency of how they label themselves and their ancestry and their ethnicity play a part in your research? Um, like, do you think that there's kind of, you know, wiggle room to say, well, you know, maybe somebody is a little race ambiguous or um, what do you, what do you think about that? Cause I'm trying to create that in my brain while I ask you. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. And I think what, what happens when we don't have like players subjective senses of self, right? As, as part of our research, we end up relying on racial and ethnic designations that are available in census data. Um, and these are place-based, right? So we're looking at in a given location where a player graduated from high school, the percentage of, I think, white, black, and Latino residents is measured through the census. Um, and we know that's, of course, that's an imperfect measurement, right? That might that may or may not fully correspond to um, individual player identities at all. Um, certainly not all people who are from, you know, white affluent places are themselves white or affluent. So our study is really only of places, right? The places in the U.S. where, where players are coming from. It doesn't at all speak to those really complicated questions that you're asking about how players may understand themselves um, and how that may be similar or different to how other people perceive them. Um, I wish there were a better way that I could think of to get at this. Um, if anyone has ideas, I would love to hear them because you could also do a really great follow-up study if you had different types of information. Okay, uh, David, we'll get to you and then Justin will come to you next. Uh, David, you go ahead. Hi, uh, thanks so much. All three really fascinating talks. Um, I, I really perked up Patrick and started texting a couple people uh, over the Scotch wool connection there. Here we go with the textile industry and the threads that connect. So um, I'd like to ask a question that I hope kind of uh, weaves the three together in some way. That's a follow up on the question just asked. Um, I'm really curious about in terms of uh, regional identity and soccer in, in the geographic locations that you're um, that you've brought this focus to Patrick um, and Rachel I, again kicking center is such a fantastic book so I'm really interested also in, in terms of the way in which your regional perspectives have shifted over the last few years. Um, so this is tied in with that and that notion of cultural identity 
to what degree is the um, pay to play environment in these spaces now? And again, I'm also thinking in some ways of the Dallas Cup. Uh, I think it was uh, Gansler today tweeted something that had a really fascinating blurb about the, the Dallas Cup from however many decades ago and the whole history of that. To what degree do you have a kind of on the ground pay to play um, culture in which uh, people are brought over at young ages and uh, um, tell the American kids, it's not soccer, it's football? Um, or, is your or is this geographic relation perhaps a little bit resistant to that, that we get on, on the East Coast or, and I hear it is on the West Coast, or is this, is this all across the country? Um, and again, to all three of you, again, it seems to me um, yet further evidence today of, of this rich sporting heritage, which would mean that when people are coming over and doing that, uh, they're in some ways taking away job opportunities for um, these young Americans who may be coming up and, and grew up with the game themselves. So I'm wondering if, I, again, I think that's kind of a little bit of a tack on to the last question, um, which I, I really love that question. But again, I'm just wondering your own experience to what degree have you meant that, that fetish of the foreign accent with youth coaches? Thanks for laughing, Bob. Well, um, from my uh, research about Thomas Corn Powell, um, <clears throat> it looks like most of his pl um, players um, were of <clears throat> foreign descent. Um, only one had played in the United States from what I can tell so far. And that was for, I believe, the University of Colorado um, college team. Most of the other players, I don't know if these claims are accurate because I haven't followed them directly. But they played primarily in Scotland. Um, some even played for um, South Africa. Um, the most famous team that they claimed to play for with the Glasgow Rangers. Um, but I haven't checked the accuracy of those. Not to jump ahead, but again, with Jeff, you know, I mean, the idea of a team called the Highlanders representing the USA is fascinating. And again, the very American phenomenon of people who have Scottish descent who have no connection to the Highlands whatsoever. They tend to be Lowlanders, right? Uh, where uh, FIPA is a little bit more popular than say Shinty or whatever, but again, you know, I, I was able to, un to find very little information about that club. Um, and I had access to the Trenton newspapers from all those years, and they didn't write about it very often. In fact, the one thing they wrote about was how disappointed the writer was that nobody from uh, the, the city government showed up to say goodbye to the Highlanders when they headed off to Dallas. But um, I do know that the team actually uh, was, was very big in Trenton, you know, for probably two or three decades. Um, but strangely enough, what happened after the tournament was that they ended up selling their name to a club from another city in, um, in New Jersey, who then essentially moved the team, I think it might have been Patterson Caledonian, moved the team to their city, renamed themselves the Highlanders, lasted one year in the American Soccer League, and then basically moved to another city and called themselves something different, and the Highlanders disappeared. Um, so another, another strange story in just the evolution of soccer in, in America, even in the Northeast. Uh, one moment, Gabe. Um, Rachel, did you want to answer David's question? Um, yeah, I think mostly I am not sure exactly how to answer. It's a good question. I think what I think of is the need for a future Nash, uh, SASH panel on soccer in the deep US South. Um, <laughs> because my perspective has certainly shifted coming from you know Midwest, from Iowa, Illinois, now down to Mississippi. Um, I certainly don't know everything about uh, you know the landscape of soccer in Mississippi, but from what I've seen, it's both very similar in some ways and very different in others. Um, different notably in just the cultural economic position of football um, and the way that kind of, in some cases, crowds everything else out. <laughs> I, I, I do wanna make um, one, one other observation too about your whole concept of pay to play. 
Um, one of the things I found my, find most interesting, and I'm really looking forward, Bo, to getting your information um, and, and going over it, because obviously there are a whole lot of clubs all over Texas. Um, but there, there is, has been a movement in Texas recently, and there's a couple of clubs in particular, um, Fort Worth Vaqueros that play in the NPSL and Laredo Heat that play in the NPSL, who have formed uh, non-pay-to-play soccer clubs um, for, their, for their members. And I'm hoping that particularly that, along with the work that's being done by all the professional league academies who have the same thing, that that becomes more of a groundswell uh, to move away from the way we're doing things right now. And one other point that I want to make about that, too, is that Austin FC, who, by the way, have done a phenomenal job of setting themselves up for success next year, um, have established a fairly unique partnership with the largest club in Austin called Lone Star Soccer Club, where they are actually funding a lot of efforts in the girls side um, because they do not actually have a woman's program at this time. And I find that unique and I hope it's something that also continues too. Okay, so we'll go to Justin and then we'll go to Gabe. Hey, thanks Patrick, thank you all for um a wonderful panel that is outside of my normal area uh, of listening, but definitely part of my interest. <clears throat> um, I'll try to keep it short for a number of reasons. I have a thesis I have to go moderate here in a moment. Patrick knows about that recently as well. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of things for the whole, uh, uh, I guess a list of things. Um, I didn't know if Allison, if you had been able to look at um, the differences between suburbs uh, and rural communities, and how that I mean, how that plays into the whole idea of the of the rich white person um, sport. Um, also for um, uh, Jeffrey as well, uh, I think one of your slides talked about uh, like 1876. There were um, girls playing um, the uh, playing playing soccer, um, and I thought it seems really it's very early comparative to when soccer is first um, created, if you will. Or, um, and I didn't know if you have any ideas that maybe for a whole, whole panel of when women began playing soccer competitively in the United States. And that may just be my ignorance on it. Um, and then I just want to throw it out there because Bo had made a comment um, about his work, which sounds fascinating, but and this will also play into everything that Jeffrey and Rachel were also talking about, I think. Um, like Sporting Kansas City, their business model is very much to support financially clubs outside of Kansas City, but in the region. So where I live in Wichita, Kansas, there is a Sporting Wichita organization that is pay to play. Um, and interestingly, as expensive as, a, as it is, there are an awful lot of families that I think are scraping to get together money to make sure their kids play in this because they're, if they reach a certain level, then they are invited to go to Kansas City and train um, in Kansas City with a, a more direct um, youth group as well. Um, and again, they're working both male and female and boys and girls at, at the same time. And I said, no, you know, this will be a discussion if Bo wants to shout at me later that he can um, you know, say, yes, I've looked at it and go on. But I didn't know if, again, with the development in Texas and the tentacles that you're talking about with Austin FC, um, are, are they following kind of what sporting did or is sporting, you know, are they, are they not the, the, the leaders they think they are uh, in both this, this wider range and, this, and male and female? Thanks. Uh, did you want me to tackle that a little bit now? I know we've got Gabe waiting. Oh, go ahead. That's up to you guys. I, I'm going to have to log off in, in about 10 minutes to start this thesis defense. So however you guys want to tackle that. Okay. Um, I haven't looked at, I mean, all those sporting clubs that you mentioned popped up uh, in my research, Wichita, Blue Valley, uh, several others. Um, there are some interesting nation, national things. There's a club in Utah that calls itself Red Wolves. I thought, Red Wolves, that's Chattanooga. They are affiliated with the Chattanooga Red Wolves. So go figure, Chattanooga to Utah. I don't, I don't understand uh, what, how that started. Uh, I don't know when Sporting Wichita and all those others started, uh, but my sense is just from seeing player development and so forth that FC Dallas was ahead of the curve in almost every respect uh, in terms of um, in terms of building academies um, and 
although Sporting Kansas City, and this is just one more thing to point out, is that they are drawing not just from the sporting clubs. There was someone who, am blanking on his name, I should know, I believe he's 19 or so and scored a pivotal goal in the playoffs just recently, um, who's from Greensboro, North Carolina, which made my ears perk up because I lived in Greensboro for four years, met my wife there, and I love it. Um, but yeah, he was playing for, I believe, NC Fusion, the local club, and Kansas City snapped him up when he was maybe 16 or so and uh, brought him into uh, Kansas City because some of these uh, MLS academies now are residential um, or they have either have host families or I believe Philadelphia was starting kind of its own dormitory, basically. So hope that answers some of your question, but, you know, talk to me offline uh, if you like. Uh, Jeff, you're uh, muted. <clears throat> The, the MLS has excuse, exclusive territories where um, they control all the youth players within that particular territory. And um, Sporting Kansas City has, because Kansas City is not as big a market as New York or Los Angeles, has a very large territory. And that's why they're able to expand out to a lot of different places. But in Texas in particular, um, there are parts of the state because Texas is so big, El Paso being a perfect example, the Rio Grande Valley being another example, where there are not um, exclusive territories for MLS clubs. So MLS clubs, the Dynamo, now Austin FC and, and FC Dallas have moved off into those territories. And one other point to the to the point that Bo, um, Bo made, FC Dallas is really quite remarkable in that uh, they also have academies in Mexico, the Caribbean, and they've established a very unique relationship with a club in Bolivia, uh, where they do some work down there too. So they, they've truly been pioneers there in, in Trailblazers. I'll just add really briefly an answer to the first part of your question. Um, no, we didn't consider rural designation. Um, we were looking at you know, metropolitan statistical areas, which include both city centers or suburban areas. Um, we could, certainly, we could take the data and look at that. Uh, my, my feeling without going back to the data and looking specifically is that actually that would reflect relatively few players, um, but it's certainly something that you could look at. All right, thank you all. Hey, Gabe, do you want to go with your question? Yeah, I have a, all three of you. Thank you for the presentation. It's quite enjoyable. And I have a question for each of you, or a question for two of you, and a comment for Rachel. Um, to begin with, Patrick, your work in Topeka, I've been reading some of the Pullman journals from the 20s, from the teens in the 20s. And I'm wondering if any of these players were affiliated with the railroad. Um, because it seems like there was a connection of working on the railroad and playing soccer. And if you were able to identify any of that, something I've kind of been looking at. And uh, also, Jeffrey, uh, these teams that came for the Pan Am games, uh, you know, Ulster out of Toronto and, and the Montreal Car Steels, they were absolutely tearing it up in Canada. Why Winnipeg? Why go out to the West and bring in uh, these folks? And uh, Trenton, I believe they were one of the amateur cup team champions of the U.S., but there were certainly some pro sides that could have had a, a rather remarkable showing. And uh, Rachel, that your, your work's also quite intriguing. <clears throat> and I'm wondering if women's soccer are now in the degree or lack thereof of more equality <laughs> that recently came out in court if um, they're going to be able to start developing uh, club teams for these professional sides and potentially begin to break away from the pay to play system. So those are my two questions and comments. And I'll, I thank you for the presentation again. And I look forward to your answers. Patrick, why don't you go ahead and start? Okay. So I do think that some of the players were connected to the railroad. Um, <clears throat> in the 1915 Thanksgiving game with Santa Fe, um, I believe that team was actually named after the railroad, um, the Addison, Topeka, Santa Fe, I believe it is. Um, so I believe they were all railroad workers um, on that team since they only play on Sundays and holidays. Um, they were definitely part-time amateur players, uh, not professional at all. 
Um, Gabe, as to, as to your uh, your questions about the team that went up, that Manitoba sent and Canadian Canadian Soccer Federation sent, there were actually some writers in the Winnipeg newspaper who asked the same question. Um, and in fact, they made the observation that it was likely that the Irish not only were not the best team in Canada, but were not probably not the best team in Winnipeg. So what the politics were that went into that decision, I have absolutely no idea. And I still don't understand um, why the United States did not send their own national team, um, especially if they were going to go play in Mexico a couple of months later uh, to play in this tournament. Though I think, you know, given that back in those days, all those players had full-time jobs, it may have just been as something as simple as they couldn't take the time off uh, to, to, to participate in that. But again, who knows what the politics were and how they went about selecting it. The national amateur champion was probably as good a choice as any under the circumstances. Hey, that is a great question, and I don't know the answer to it. Um, I certainly haven't read anything that I can recall um, that there are plans underway to create new club teams. Um, I, I personally would be a little surprised to see that happen anytime in, in the immediate future, but who knows? That's a good question. We'll see. Go ahead, Marcus. First of all, I want to thank everybody for this opportunity. I just joined uh, SASH and this is the first uh, meeting I've been to. So uh, th this is really interesting. And, and Rachel, I wanted to ask the question, you know, um, your data, the, the first thing, question that comes to mind for me is that certainly it shows that elite um, soccer is a, you know, quote, rich white uh, sport in America. Uh, but it, it, the question I have is, is, is soccer in general, a uh, which uh, which white sport in 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 the U.S. and I'm wondering if you you've compared your data or you know any thoughts about comparing your data to general participation. Um, you know, are the same demographic predictors that you're seeing with elite soccer? Uh, do those truly uh, 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 predict participation in general? That's a really good question, um, and I think there are ways you could probably access data to answer it. They require either accessing some data sets that um, are currently either private or take a while to gain access to, like I'm thinking of monitoring the future data of high school students might have place identifiers where you could locate, you know, more recreational or younger particip kids participation. Um, there are organizations, including the Aspen Institute, that might have data. You'd have to partner with them and gain access to it. Um, so it's possible. I can't think of I can't think of any data that would be easily public um, or that you could easily compile from public data to, to answer that question, but it would be a good one, right? Because it's one thing to look at the elite level, but if you think about the number of participants in the US in a given time, you know, most of them are not at the elite level by any means. And so maybe the more important question is the places that, you know, that are producing just everyday participants, kids, youth, adults. Can I hop in quickly and address something about uh, women's clubs? Because um, um, there are, you know, one trend that's come up uh, recently, it, uh, women's soccer fought for a long time against this, but now they've uh, kind of embraced it, which is uh, having an intertwined men's and women's operation. So for example, I mean, in Houston, you have the Dynamo and the Dash, which by the way, run a league called the Dynamo Dash League that has a lot of uh, youth soccer clubs involved in it. Um, NCFC and The Courage are intertwined. They are the employers of one Cindy Cohn, the current U.S. soccer interim president, uh, who is running again. Um, that's kind of controversial. There are people who think it's great because the women's team gets resources they wouldn't normally have. Uh, a lot of English operations are uh, lauded and uh, English clubs, you know, you see Manchester City and Tottenham have brought over, you know, Tobin Heath and Kristen Press and Alex Morgan and so forth. Uh, the one thought I had recently that worried me is there are three clubs in the Women's Super League in England that uh, are not Premier League clubs. And as we all know, due to COVID, uh, if you're not getting Premier League money, you're teetering a little bit right now. And it's going to be interesting to see if any of those clubs end up cutting their women's teams, I mean, which would be horrifying. But uh, that's a concern that a lot of people have and a concern that people have in the United States as well. I mean, England would be an interesting test case to see uh, if they can keep things going through COVID. Uh, and then we can see how that relates to uh, men's and women's teams 
intertwining. And of course, you know, you look at FC Dallas, they started a thriving uh, girls, you know, organization uh, without, you know, without having a women's team there. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, you mentioned uh, Austin, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there as well. Any other last minute questions? Patrick, I actually have one. Um, this is on behalf of Kevin. He asked me to get uh, these last couple of questions in. Uh, he was saying he's curious to know more about the playing of different football codes in both the Texas cases and in Topeka. Um, you know, he mentions there's lots of evidence in the UK of clubs playing both rugby and association throughout the 1870s and into the 1880s. But this is one of the few mentions we see of this sort of switching and alternating in the United States. So he wa was wondering if you guys could talk to that. And then just so I can get this in quickly, uh, for Rachel, um, he was curious to know if there's any potential for stretching this research back historically. Um, he was thinking of Diana Bone, who played for the U-20 Dallas team um, at the Invitational in Hong Kong in 1978. And just, you know, the fact that we have so little information from this era, like, what is that potential? So I'll leave that there. Would you like to, uh... oh, Jeff, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I, okay. the, um... The, the whole thing of soccer versus rugby is really, really challenging to figure out, to be honest with you. And, um, and, and because there was very little detail in the newspapers about what actually was being played back in those days. The, the most bizarre article I found was two um, schools in Austin playing a game that had the most detailed description of what the game was actually out. And frankly, I read the article 20 times and I have, still haven't figured out what they were playing. Um, it included, you know, a story about somebody guarding home base and, um, and, and, you know, and kicking the ball 10 feet over the goalie's head. So I, you know, to me, it was maybe some conglomeration of soccer and, and rugby, uh, from, from near what I can tell, but I do know in San Antonio that, um, these athletic clubs, uh, with mission athletic club being a perfect example of that. They seem to have a group of players that would that would move between the two sports um, and between rugby and, and soccer. And, and then eventually, as I pointed out, um, rugby ended up winning. And that's the direction all of the clubs went in San Antonio went. Um, and, and coincidentally, pushing it a little bit further into the 1950s in San Antonio, when there was virtually no soccer going on, um, what I found was that there was a lot of movement between the baseball and the soccer teams. Um, the baseball teams would play. And then when they were in the off season, they would play soccer. And it was mostly because they were athletes. And I guess that was just what they did. Um, but I, but to me, I wish I could answer your question with specifics, but it's really, really challenging to figure it out. Okay. Uh, Rachel, if you'd like to answer this question. Yeah, sure. Um, the, the short answer is that, yes, there's absolutely possibility there. And it, would be really valuable information because it, it, there's so little about earlier time periods. Um, it isn't something that I'm planning on working on right now. Um, I've kind of moved on to other soccer projects at the moment, um, but certainly it would be worth doing. Excellent. Well, um, thank you so much. And uh, thank you uh, for your responses, both because I found them fascinating and on Kevin's behalf as well, because his phone died and he wanted to make sure he got those in. <laughs> I, if there are no more questions, uh, we will go ahead and end the uh, last First Friday session of 2020. Um, so just wait for any more questions for just a second. No? Okay. <clears throat> thank you all for uh, attending this panel and thank you, Rachel and Jeff for also agreeing to uh, be part of the panel. It was really enjoyable. Thank you.